Welcome, everyone, to today's Talks at Google event. Um, I'm Vishal Jain. I'm a product manager here at Google. And I'm happy to host our guest today, the founder and CEO of KindBar, and also the author of this book, Do the Kind Thing, where he talks about his experiences starting the KindBar company and some of the lessons he's learned that can apply to socially conscious enterprises around the world. So with that, I'd like to introduce Daniel Lubetsky. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Guys. So today, I thought that a good format would be for us to just ask you know, a few questions. And we'll get into some audience questions later on as well. Uh, and I apologize in advance if it sounds as though we're interviewing for you for a job at Google. <laughs> I assure you we're not. Um, I, it, would be a, it would be an honor and a pleasure if I could even try to make it. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to have you if, if you decide that you want to uh, change careers. You, you heard it here first. <laughs> Uh, so Daniel, one of the um, really interesting things about what you've done is you've made a market in an industry that's very different than uh, our industry here at Google, which is in the consumer packaged goods world. Um, and obviously, we have kind bars distributed around Google's micro kitchens in all of our offices, and we love the product. But as someone who's done something really Thank interesting, you guys. yeah, <laughs> as someone who's done something really interesting in the CPG world, I was just curious about when you look at the the landscape today, what CPG companies are really inspiring you, and what brands you think have really done something interesting out there? Um, so, but you want me to focus on CPG companies in particular. I, I find uh, companies that are true to their brands to the ones that most interest me. It doesn't necessarily need to be a socially conscious brand. I mean, I, I, I really admire Starbucks. They're a partner of ours, and we, I really like a lot of what they do. I really like Target as uh, retailers. And I mean, I can't, there's so many different companies I like. But I like brands like Snickers. I think Snickers is a very authentic brand. It's very much about, it knows what it is. Snickers satisfies you. It does a very good job at, at being fun and irreverent. It doesn't try to be something else. So I think what, what the brands that I enjoy the most are the ones that really understand their value proposition and who they are and what customer they cater for, and then they just live their brand. I, I like Lululemon a lot in terms of uh, what they've achieved in such a short time. But it's it's not necessarily the the socially conscious brand for me that I would veer. It, it, it's, it's most about authenticity. That makes a lot of sense. And I can see how uh, you know Snickers, in that sense, is, it must have been one of your inspirations as well when you were starting. Well, I wouldn't go that far. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I mean, I admire Snickers, but they're a very different value proposition from ours. But I, I just think that they know who they are and what they are, and they don't try to be something else. I think what's dangerous is when a brand, because there is the consumer change uh, tastes are changing a lot. And Snickers is always going to have a great market for the mass consumer that wants a candy bar. And, and it's a great product. But for people that want to you know, eat more nutritionally dense products, there's a completely different product. And what I think would be dangerous is for Snickers to try to become what it's not. That's why I admire them, not because I aspire or, or, or took that much inspiration from them, other than that they learned who they are. When I started my first company, I didn't really think enough about these issues. And I was trying to do everything, be everything for everybody. And I talk a lot about the most embarrassing examples in the book. But I really was trying to do a lot of things at once and cater to a lot of different type of consumers. And I wasn't sufficiently mindful about the importance of being obsessive about what your brand is and what it should stand for. And somebody once said that um, a brand is a promise. And a great brand is a promise well kept. And that has really stayed with me, particularly after the many mistakes and failures in my earlier career when I was not being sufficiently obsessive about staying within the guardrails of the, of the brand promise that we made. That's, that's really well put. I like that. Uh, it's interesting you talk about the combination of different value propositions. And um, in the book, you talk a lot about the end principle. Um, and it sounds as though you're basically saying, you know, you got to pick sort of the right two or three things that you really want to combine together that haven't been combined together before. Uh, obviously, for Kind Bar, um, taste and health in the same product was, uh, I think, the, the big unique value proposition you brought to the market. Um, I was just curious when you look at you know the Google product portfolio, uh, and when you look at the technology industry as a whole, uh, do you see opportunities in technology where the end principle could be applied, um, 
And are there any products, for example, that, that Google makes that you think represent the same sort of and principle that Kindbar started with? You ask easy questions, only softballs. <laughs> Uh, let me try to go back for one second and just make sure that everybody knows what the AND philosophy is. So at KIND, uh, what we try to do is to question false assumptions and to try to get to what those false assumptions is because there's a lot of opportunity to create value, certainly in the technology world even more than any, by trying to see how have people been doing something and do we really need to accept it as you know, uh, dogma that this is the way it has to be done. And very often, because our brains are efficient, they shortcut to the easiest answer or the fastest answer rather than the one that would be best in the long term. Sometimes in the long term, if you work harder up front, you can achieve goals that may be seemingly attention. And so the AND philosophy is about trying to combine goals that are seemingly impossible to achieve at the same time. So for kind, it's about doing something that's nutritionally rich and delicious, where it's both nutritious and delicious, or something that is economically sustainable and socially impactful, or a product that actually travels well, that's convenient to travel with, but that's wholesome. So those are goals that normally people think are attention and not compatible, and if you really work hard enough, you can achieve. And when you're able to uncover it, you actually unleash a lot of value. So in the technology world, you look at, uh, at the way things are and then say, well, why, why does, is it really true that it has to be this way? And you ask the questions why and why not. And if you're able to find the underlying assumptions, you're already well on the way to trying to challenge those assumptions and see if they can be actually uh, broken. And so in your world, an example, uh, well, first of all, I think the way Google's philosophy works, and we were talking about this a second ago, yeah. I think really is in the long term, it's very long term oriented, right? They don't try to win 100% of the time at all time in the short term. They try to give the consumer the best solution and they know if they do that, then people will continuously go into the search product. So they combine between, I guess in some ways saying, and in the search platform, you can get links or you can actually sometimes get the answers. And how do you decide whether, you know, you could probably sell more ads if you generated more pages, but sometimes the consumer wants a more immediate answer, and if you're able to serve that up, even if you're not gonna generate more pages or, or, or if you're gonna compete with yourselves or with others, you're trying to find that right medium. And the, but the standard is always, what is the best consumer experience? What, is, what does that end user want? And I think that should always be the standard. Uh, I remember on YouTube, uh, I'm gonna date myself because you guys were probably not born, but there was, was a time where on YouTube you couldn't click inside the videos. Is that, did you realize that? Or like, there was a time where YouTube didn't exist. <laughs> but <laughs> you guys probably don't know. Um, but, but there was a need. It was, it, it, it was this ability, to, why not? Why not be able to view the experience and interact with it? And somebody, uh, Chad Hurley or someone who, who used to support us many years ago also on, on the social front, on other work I've done, figured out that you know at some point that there's a way to do it and to have the video experience also be interactive. So certainly technology is probably one of the best grounds for disruptiveness and for you to think with and. The challenge is for us as human beings because, sorry, I'm giving you a very long answer. No, no, it's really I should give you profound and concise answers, but I'm not good <laughs> at that stuff. But, the, um, but the, the challenge is not that technology can't do stuff. The challenge is that our brains have been so trained to do things every day the same way that for us to step back is so important. And even with our technologies, we get used to how things are. That's why fresh eyes and fresh brains can really, really be disruptive and win often when you are able to see things differently. And you, in the book, I talk a lot about how to try to find a way to keep that fresh perspective even when you're used to doing something and some tools that we use at Kind to, to try to think differently. Very cool. And I noticed a lot of similarities there, actually, between the way Google and Kind look at uh, the, the consumer value proposition and the intention. Well, thank of you for saying that. Well I, obviously, Google does an awesome job. So, Thank you. Uh, maybe more of a softball question. Uh, in the book, you talked a little bit about the origin of your, uh, your food industry experience on the work that you did with PeaceWorks, uh, where you worked with Israeli and Palestinian businesses 
um, to build bridges between those two cultural groups. Um, one of the things that I was curious about was what, um, what was sort of your business model as a, as a consultant there? Uh, you obviously had a social cause, but you also needed to make money. The PeaceWorks business model? Yes. So right after law school, my first company after law school uh, was and is still called PeaceWorks, and it tries to bring neighbors in conflict regions to work together. And I actually did try first as a consultant, but here was this confused Mexican Jewish lawyer trying to consult to Arabs and Israelis. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. So I, uh, I tried to build a consulting business to try to get Arabs and Israelis to work together. And the Americans were going to be the catalysts to these joint ventures. But the consulting thing went nowhere. And I decided to end up actually starting such a venture, a PeaceWorks venture, where we brought trading partners to trade with one another. And the way, the, the way it started is I, I was doing this research, and I came across this jar of a sun-dried tomato spread, uh, which back in the early 90s, at least to me, I had never heard of sun-dried tomatoes. Today, again, we take that for granted. But in 93, when I came across this jar of sun-dried tomato spread, I had never heard of sun-dried tomatoes. I bought the jar. I downed the whole thing one evening in my late research. And I tried to buy some more, and there was no more in the store. So long story short, I like almost choked to death the, the manager at the store to, for him to give me the name of the f former manufacturer. And I'm joking. It was not violent. I was, <laughs> but I did insist a lot to get the information. And uh, I got to the uh, ex-manufacturer of this product. And it turned out he was buying his sun-dried tomatoes from, it, uh, from Italy and his glass jars from Portugal. And it was very expensive. And I showed him that he could buy his glass jars from Egypt and buy his sun-dried tomatoes from Turkey. I we started sourcing olives and olive oil from Palestinian and Arab Israeli farmers. And the model was that this Israeli manufacturer, this Israeli Jewish manufacturer, would trade with Arab citizens of Israel, with Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, with Turks, Egyptians, and other Arab neighbors. And by them trading with one another, the concept of peace works was that they would shatter cultural stereotypes, they would discover each other's humanity, and then they would cement business relationships because they would be working with one another. So we launched in 93, 94, this line called first Moshe and Ali's. The original name was very, very succinct. Moshe Pupik and Ali Mishmunkum's world famous were gourmet foods. And nobody could pronounce it. And <laughs> I learned about simplicity that, through that <laughs> lesson. And I talk about that story there also. Um, but that was the model. The model was a trading model. I, I would buy the products from my trading partners and sell them in the United States, and then they would work together. And the, the nice thing about the social concept was that the more that we would sell these products, the more that we could buy from them, the more that we could foster that trade among neighbors. Very cool. And you can see that it was so successful that we have peace in the Middle East, everything is solved. So. <laughs> Well, we have sun-dried tomatoes, which is... We have not, and, and at the macro level, we have not scaled the way we'd like. I'm actually now going to reinvest in doing PeaceWorks 2.0 because I, I, I really have neglected it the last 20 plus years. But at the, at the personal level, many of the relationships that started 21 years ago are still there today. And throughout the vicissitudes of the conflict, Yoel Benesh continuing training with Abdullah Ghanem's family. Abdullah passed on passed away, but his son still trades with him. So those relationships at the personal level did get cemented. Very cool. Uh, and is that, you, you mentioned sun-dried tomatoes, which is obviously in the food industry. Is that um, then how you organically kind of moved into you know, nuts and fruits and eventually what became the, the constituents of Kind Bar? And you know, how did you decide that snack bars was where you wanted to yeah, start? Yeah, if you had told me right after law school that I was going to be in the food space, I would say, you're cuckoo. I mean, I, I, I never was part of my dream as growing up. You know, I was a magician, and I sold watches, and I did a lot of crazy jobs. But, um, but at the beginning, food was a conduit towards that pursuing my mission of bringing neighbors together. And then I fell in love with it, and I really started liking it. It took a while, but I, uh, you know, f at the beginning, I was suffering a lot because I was making so many mistakes. and 
unfortunately, I didn't realize how bad I had it. But the first 11 years when I was like going up and down the streets of Manhattan, selling store by store with my briefcase, with my leather briefcase or fake leather briefcase, <laughs> not even leather briefcase, <laughs> my fake leather briefcase, and take out the legal books and put jars of some dried tomato spread and uh, bread for people to sample the product. And I would go starting at 7 a.m. in the morning on 122nd Street and Broadway and walk the west side of Broadway all the way down to Wall Street and then I would cross and then I would walk all the way up. And you know, after a couple of days of taking orders, the next day I would take my beat up cougar and I put the product in the trunk and I would seal it with duct tape because the trunk was uh, broken and I would deliver the product. And I forgot why I'm telling you this whole story. <laughs> <laughs> what we're talking about. Um, oh, yeah, I have the transition. So then, after 11 years of mistakes, I I learned about the food space, and I was traveling to do ventures, you know, all over in the Middle East and in Sri Lanka and in Indonesia and in Mexico, not focusing, trying to do a lot of things at once, and. As I was traveling or I was skipping lunch or skipping dinner or traveling in the US to sell, I felt very frustrated with my own snacking options. And I, I always sensed that there were opportunities to do healthful snacking better. And it wasn't satisfying me. I wasn't finding something that I could feel good about eating. And so I kept being on the search. And you know, once we came up with Kind, you know, I, I knew that there was going to be something that would satisfy others too because I felt that there was that need. And today, by the way, 11 years later, it, it's just the beginning. I mean, the revolution of eating more mindfully, more healthfully, uh, and snacking, and healthful snacking, and responsible snacking, is just at the beginning. Even though it's very disruptive, we're just entering it. I, I think. Uh, it's going to be far, far more disruptive in the coming years because those trends are so powerful. You know, all of us are busy, and so we're on the go. But we want to eat something wholesome and nutritious and real. <coughs> and uh, at the same time, uh, so so the the need for convenience and the need for healthfulness is really uh, providing a lot of opportunities for a lot of people. That's really fascinating. So it actually had a lot to do with your own personal travels and the fact that you're you're always on the go. So that format was something you hadn't yeah. before. Still today, I mean, I have four children. They, when I get home at 6 p.m., I have a very nice meal waiting for me. But for lunch, I tend to, Juliana and Rebecca can attest to it. Every morning, every day uh, for lunch, I tend to have one or two kind bars. Um, that's kind. That's my lunch. They also don't let me do anything else. I try sometimes to escape. They're like, no, you should eat two kind bars. <laughs> I want to shift a little bit um, away from the, the business and into the book. Uh, you know, we all have a story to tell, but not everyone takes the time to, you know, to sit down and actually write it through thoroughly. Um, and you've, uh, you've obviously put a lot of thought and time into producing this. Um, so I, I guess, why the transition from the food industry into the publishing industry, so to speak? Well, it's not. Tr I mean, I'm. Uh, this is more a way to help us deepen into the work that we're doing. But I think two primary reasons. One is. Uh, a lot of people gave a lot to me in my 11 years of the wilderness. Even still today, I have a lot of mentors. And Ben Cohen, the guy that started Ben and & Jerry's, and uh, many other people were on my advisory board and just taught me a lot of what I know. And now when young entrepreneurs come to me and ask me questions, I don't have enough time to go as deep as I would like. And I felt that the book really is a very raw exposition of a lot of the failures, because I think from the failures you derive more lessons as well as uh, the insights and, the, and, and, and some of the successes. So it was a way for people that want to learn from my mistakes, to, that, that whether it's social entrepreneurs or people in the food space, or just people that want to learn how to think with and or think creatively or, or just draw from any of those experiences. Um, and the second is that for our aspiration and our dream for what, what we want kind to become, we don't want to be a company. We want to become a movement. We don't want to just be a business that has a social responsibility. We want to transcend the way people think of businesses or, or products to something that they connect with viscerally, that belongs to them, that becomes a state of mind. And it probably sounds like you think that I had something very weird for breakfast. But in the coming years, you'll see some of the ideas that we have and how we're going to implement that. And the first step in trying to build that was to share people our vision of what we were trying to create. 
so that hopefully they'll be more excited about joining us on that journey and learning about it. So telling people about our our products are sold. We we understand why you guys buy our products or why they, you get them here at the, uh, what do you call them? Micro, uh, micro kitchens. Micro kitchens. Because they're delicious and because they're made with nutritional uh nutritionally rich ingredients and so we never forget that and also because in my early years at Peaceworks I was so obsessive about the mission of bringing Arabs and Israelis together that that's all I would talk about. I made the mistake of not focusing on the product and at kind I promised myself that I would focus on the product. So for the last 10-11 years we've talked very little about our social mission and through the book it's giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly about where we're coming from, what what's important to us, what we're aiming to do in society, as a first step in 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 the, in our the remaining journey that we have. Okay, cool. And uh, just so you guys know, in the audience, we'll be getting audience questions in a little bit. Um, just want to step up to the microphone and start thinking about what questions you might have. Uh, and one of the other things you spoke about in the book um, that I was curious to learn more about, and I was hoping you could tell us more about, is the universal values. Curriculum. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about you know, what that is and yeah. So that's unrelated to, not not so directly related to kind, but it's something else that I care a lot about. I think that. Well, let me take one step back because I've been talking about this a lot in the last week, but maybe you guys have never heard about it. But a lot of what drives me is that my father was a Holocaust survivor, and he was in a concentration camp in Dachau. So. The common thread in all I do is trying to build bridges, not to be nice to society, but as a survival instinct, because I want my children to not have happened to them what happened to my father. I want other human beings not to have happened to them what happened to my father. So one of the things that I think a lot about as we see what's going on in the Middle East with ISIS, the Islamic State, and um, so many divisions within societies and between societies and what's happening in Israel, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and more broadly. Um, and also when you think more broadly about climate change, about resource scarcity, two billion people are elevating the standard of living and what that means is that more people are going to demand more premium products that require more from our earth and water scarcity in California, water scarcity globally, uh, scarcity of natural resources and food, nuclear proliferation. These things are major challenges that we're going to face as a society. And the only chance we have as a human race to survive is to recognize our shared humanity and to, and to work together as, as one. And the divisions that are in some ways actually deepening over the last few years uh, between the West and the East um, and in the Middle East, I think need to be challenged. And the way you challenge those is not just through military means. I personally, my father survived because American soldiers rescued him. So I, 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 I'm very grateful for uh, the military's sacrifice for people that they had never met, like my father. And so I do think there is a role to play in, in using force very cautiously to, to fight totalitarianism, but it's never going to be enough. And the way to really, really win ultimately is to have an alternative ideology. And one of my thoughts was, this is a very long way to yeah. answer your question, but it's a deep conversation, is if you look today at the community of nations at the United Nations, there is 200 members of the United Nations and they've created laws on the law of the sea and on all these other compacts but on this core issue of shared values and education, we've done nothing. In the sense that today, there's nothing that a kid in Israel or in Palestine or in Iran or in the United States necessarily share. That they don't necessarily get taught what brings us together as a human race. Why not create a common core curriculum where we encourage and ultimately, if we succeed, mandate that all third graders or all first graders are going to share in this common core curriculum to discover each other's humanity, to learn. Now we can use technology to, for, to connect them. Uh, Google can be a partner. Skype can be a partner. Others can be partners to try to get to build more threads between kids all across the world, starting with educational materials where they ask themselves, 
what makes me a human being, what do I have in common with other kids, and for them to ask those questions, for them to be the ones that discover the answers, and then connecting kids through technology so that kids across the world all are part of sharing the same set of values of learning what brings us together as human beings. So the idea is the universal values curriculum is something that I'm starting slowly. I've been working on it for 10 years, but hopefully this year we're going to start funding it and working with educators to create this common curriculum that we'll offer for free for schools that uh, commit to teach it. I will even provide them incentives or tools, educational materials. There's already a potential partner in Pakistan that has a half a million uh, students that they fund, and there's different programs all over the world that we hope will will join this and be part of it. And the dream is that X number of years from now, the United Nations, all members, all the community of nations will mandate that all kids across the world will, will, will learn about their shared humanity and become part of something bigger than ourselves. Simple idea. <laughs> It is actually a simple idea, really, at its root, but it's, uh, it's just yeah, probably it's more complicated to, to actually uh, bring it to life. Um, I guess wrapping up uh, with my questions, uh, you spoke a little bit about what's next for Kind Bar and, uh, and how the book plays into the long-term mission, but uh, just whatever you can share with us about you know, what some of those um, big next milestones for either for the book or for the company are. By the way, it's not Kind Bar, it's Kind. And uh, we have a couple of team members that work for the Clusters team, and they might otherwise really come after you <laughs> if I don't clarify that. <laughs> Some of you got the parfait with the, with the Kind Hildegrain Clusters. But kind, we never wanted to be a bar company. We happen to know that bars are a very efficient way for people to travel, and so we're very proud of being part of that. But that's not what defines us. What defines us, the common thread among all kind products, is ingredients you can see and pronounce. That's our trademark. So whether it's in bar format, like the original Fruit Nut bars, or I don't know if you've seen or you have carry in your micro kitchens the strong and kind bars that have savory flavors. So if you're feeling like something savory, instead of a bag of potato chips, you can get something more nutritionally rich that, that has 10 grams of protein, all natural. So that's the strong and kind bars. I'm giving you my ad. Or, uh, or whether it's the kind healthy grain bars, which are kind of like a better type of granola that has five super grains like amaranth and quinoa and chia and gluten-free oats, et cetera, uh, and buckwheat, uh, or the kind healthy grain clusters, which are not. So in, in our vision, what's next for us is, if you look at all those four areas where we've innovated, we tried and we'd like to believe that we brought something totally new that didn't exist in the marketplace before, that was fresh and that people needed even or wanted even though they didn't know it till we created it. So that's our standard. We want to innovate in new categories, but we only want to do it when we really are not going to do a me to item or just try to copy and do something like somebody else. We want to do it where we really can disrupt the space and really elevate the standards for that particular category. Uh, this fall, we're launching another uh, new product line, again, in, into a new space. And every year or two, our ambition is to be able to enter a new category with products that are, that are elevating the standards of healthful eating. But we have sometimes gotten it wrong and just lo not, lo not launched. Um, so we also have the discipline to say, if we don't, it's very different from technology. In technology, you can go and try something and fail fast and start again, and you're giving out the product for free in some sense. So you can allow people to say, I didn't like it, beta test, whatever. But in food, what I've found in consumer product goods is when you try our product, it's a promise that we gave you that you're going to have a great experience. And if we disappoint you, you're not going to not just not try that product again, but you might abandon our brand. So we're very, very obsessive the way we launch products. It has to be exceeding people's expectations. And if when we do all the work, when it, all is said and done, we don't think that it's going to raise the bar and exceed your expectations, we just have had the discipline to not launch it. So that's, uh, we hopefully will continue innovating, but with that, um, with the humility to know that if you get it wrong, you should just not be there. That's a, that's a pretty hard discipline to <laughs> stick to. Especially so when you've invested that. yourself so hard into something and you're like, ah, all right, let's walk away. With that, do uh, any of the folks in the audience have? Elijah, please. 
It's the Passover allusion to the person that's not by the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can't match John Stewart. I am a huge kind fan. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming today. Um, Thank you so much. My question is about uh, this ambitious growth strategy that you've just uh, described to us. Um, how do you plan to finance it? And do you grow concerned that at a certain point there's a tension between involving other investors um, who may have a different uh, uh, position on how best to grow the company um, and your personal vision for how the company should grow? So we. Um I'm very lucky because I screwed up so bad for the first 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years that nobody wanted to invest in my company. So I ended up owning most of it till, till the company was healthy enough that I didn't dilute myself so much. Um, but I did bring investors in. We, we brought in investors in 2008. And then they were great partners. They taught me a ton. And then in 2000, and th we had a commitment that they would be with us for uh, up to five years, four and a half years. So I think it was 2012, 13, where we bought them back. And uh, it was a very difficult thing to do because the company had performed well, so we had, they made a lot of money. Uh, but they deserved it. They, did, they added a lot of value. And we financed that in two ways. One is we took debt for the first time, because I'm very averse to, to debt, but we took some debt on. And we also brought in a new investor that could help take us to the next level, that could add be smart money. And um, we were very upfront with them about what our values are and the fact that we're doing this for more than just money and that we this our social mission is not negotiable. And they understood that the social mission actually feeds loyalty and that it has a positive impact on the business also. And also, it happens to be good that I'm the majority shareholder. So. So then, I I, I have uh, they do have protections as investors, but I ultimately I listen to them. I I I, I don't think I've ever reached a decision that wasn't unanimous. Like we, our board really has saved me for myself sometimes because it's very important to be creative and to come up with all these crazy ideas. But you also need to have filters. And I talk a lot about the book in the book about how to divide the creative process from the filtering process, and they have to be very separate, and uh, how to really, really come up with completely differentiated ideas, and then how to test them. And I think it's very important to separate those stages. But um, currently, we're cash flow positive, so we don't need more money. So the question is, what am I going to do with it? And we explore going public. And for now, as of right now, we don't think that that's the right answer for us. We're having a lot of fun and building a lot, uh, a community and a movement internally also. Like we have every team member that works at Kind, who's a full-time team member, is a fellow shareholder in the company. And so for now, at least, we're going to co continue doing it ourselves. But who knows what happens tomorrow? Hi, thanks for coming. So I really loved what you were saying about brand authenticity. And uh, we work with a lot of brands that um, have clear brand equity, but have fallen out of public favor, cereal brands, for instance. So I'm just curious what your advice would be to those brands and really tapping into what makes them authentic. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I actually think about that question a lot, because I, it's so easy for me to say, be true to your brand. But what if your brand? falls in disfavor. <laughs> First of all, everything is relative, right? The, the cereal space is still a $29 billion space or $22 billion space. It's very big. It's bigger than the nutritional bar space. Now, nutritional bars are growing, and cereal is slowly contracting. So yes, it's, it's, it's not a growing area, but it's a gigantic area. A lot of people still have cereal. So. You know, these, these guys have very smart people, too. And I think I've, I've seen some of the moves that Kellogg's and General Mills have taken to try to take their cereal equity into convenience and make their products more convenient to carry and travel on the go. I think that's good. I think that's smart. And I think they're, they're going to see some payoff from that. What would work, what would not work is, I think what you need to do first and foremost is to understand your brand well and understand what is the consumer expecting from you and does your brand have license to go somewhere else. So an indulgent brand 
that is selling sugary beverages or cereal or, or, or stuff like that, that brand should probably not try to reposition itself as a healthy brand because the consumer is not going to trust it. A, a brand that does that and s tries to proclaim itself to be something else, it probably will actually hurt the parent brand because it will seem unauthentic. So I think the most important thing is to be authentic, to understand what is it that you are and, and, and what does your core consumer care about and then do that for your consumer. And then if you're a gigantic company and, um, and you feel that you need to go in another category, sometimes it's better to just acquire or start a new brand than to have a brand that has negative equity in the particular place where you want to go. But I also don't, I don't believe that you need to go to all places. I, I've seen a lot of friends and other companies say, oh wow, right now the hot thing is organic. And oh wow, right now it's gluten-free. And then they come up with gluten-free salsa. Well, yeah, salsa is gluten-free because it doesn't have, you know, gluten. But, but it's not, it, it's, consumers are very sophisticated in the end of the day. You can actually fool them once or twice, but in the longer term, in the midterm, they're, they're gonna figure it out. So I think you need to really, really be authentic and understand what your brand stands for and, and have a conversation with your own consumers and with yourself and then figure out how to deliver to them what that is. Again, in, in the cereal space, there are so many opportunities within that brand equity. I, I just would try to get to stay there. Fortunately, I don't have to answer that question for real because it, you know, these are, there's $60 billion companies, $100 billion companies that have a lot of these legacy challenges and, uh, and it's not easy. And a lot of the people leading these companies are formidable good human beings and they're just inheriting these challenges and it's, it's not easy. So we have a couple of uh, young vegetarians, so Kind has been a great way to get at least a little bit of protein into them, so thank you for that. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the uh, salted chocolate caramel, um, personally. But Thank you. You, you actually anticipated my question, which is, I, as, a consumer, as a consumer, the only reason I hesitate to buy sometimes is you don't have an organic option. So what has been your, your take on the whole organic movement, and is that yeah. something that might be in the works? No, I mean, we, we, we think about these questions all the time. For us, um, we needed to choose what we're going to be as a brand, and what we chose is to provide people nutritionally rich premium ingredients. And in our particular categories where we play, uh, we felt that that was what was most important and most differentiated for us to add. And, you know, I respect a lot other fair trade, organic, other things that are important. We try to behave environmentally responsibly. We have a, we're doing a whole 360 evaluation ourselves about how to do things in, in an environmentally responsible way. We try to source everything we kind of responsible manner, in a fair manner, but to certify ourselves organic, to certify ourselves fair trade, to certify everything, the product would be outside of the reach of people. We already are the most expensive product because we give you a lot more whole almonds and whole nuts and treat the product with, with a lot of, lot of respect. And so we needed to choose what was the most important thing for us to provide to the consumer. There's also a, an issue of sustainability that, I, that concerns me a lot. Like right now there's not enough honey in the world to, there's not enough organic honey, there's not enough uh, organic almonds to supply what we buy. And it's shocking how dangerous the situation is. I was alluding to scarcity of food. It's a very serious problem. There's huge drought problems in California. There's uh, bee collapse uh, challenges that are finally starting to come out, but still the, the amount of production of almonds and of honey in the last several years has been so challenged, and in the meantime, consumption's skyrocketing, so that's why these things are becoming more and more expensive, and as we're gonna need to feed two billion more people, there's a lot of questions that as a society we need to ask ourselves about how we're gonna be feeding all of those two billion people. Right now, what our team is obsessing about is being able to be able to even source uh, quality products uh, on a sustainable basis. So uh, there's a lot of questions that we're challenged with to try to uh, balance. As a brand, we want to just continue always being nutritionally rich ingredients that you can see and pronounce. Thank you. Hi. My kids love the uh, kind cluster, so thank you for making things that my kids will actually eat.
Thank you so much. <laughs> and I didn't pay any of them to say this. <laughs> um, you talked a little bit about um, mistakes that you made um, when you were a fledging startup. Um, can you talk a little bit about anything that really sticks to your mind, um, lessons that you learned as you're growing, and especially in the arena of growing, uh, changing, shifting categories from bars to clusters, for instance? Um, I actually talk, uh, first of all, my biggest mistakes were I drew the most, and that's why I really showed them in the book, was in the first 11 years when I didn't know anything and I just kept making mistake after mistake. And from those lessons, I think a lot of kind success was because we were more focused, whereas in the first 10, 11 years, we were very undisciplined in, in every way, trying to develop too many products as opposed to staying focused on the, the way we do it now, trying to go into too many stores, any store that would have us, as opposed to having a migration strategy and being uh, focused on how we, on how we expand. Um, in, to your question about going from bars to clusters, there's, and I talk about this in a lot more depth in the book, but I'll tell you two, two quick thoughts. One is, there was a reason why we chose to go to clusters first rather than to another set of bars, that we wanted to communicate to the consumer that we were not a bar company, but a healthy snacking company and a healthy eating company whose common thread was not the bar format, but the use of nutritionally rich ingredients that you could see and pronounce. So we were thinking about doing another granola bar, and we thought, then people are going to think we're the kind bar company. Even right now, they still not to put, uh, <laughs> My to put you on the spot. Team. No, but but a lot of people still think of us as a bar company. And we 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 early on decided to do the clusters. It's a much smaller category. Uh, the granola, the bad granola category, I think it's like four hundred million dollars compared to the granola bar category, which is like four billion dollars. So granola bars are a much bigger space. Logically, we should have gone there, but we consci consciously decided to first go to clusters because we wanted to convey to the consumer this point. And when you're building products, oftentimes the second line you introduce is as or more important than the first because you're connecting the dots. Actually, Eric Berman, who I think actually works here at, uh, at Google, uh, uh, first taught me that point, um, that you know, okay, this is what the kind fruit nut bars are, but what is the common thread? It could be that we use fruits, it could be that we use nuts, it could be that you, we use nutritionally rich ingredients, it could be the bar format, so on and so forth. By launching the clusters, we connected and we said, the common thread is ingredients you can see and pronounce, it's nutritionally rich ingredients, it, it's not necessarily the bar format. We made a, a, a mistake when we started with the clusters, you know, several years ago, in not sufficiently understanding how sensitive those grains that we were sourcing were. And um, the, the, the use of grains that we use, amaranth, is very, very susceptible to go rancid. And so you need to treat it with a lot of respect. You really, really, really need to protect it. And early on when we launched the clusters, like a month into it, we started getting complaints from consumers that they felt the product was rancid. And we were freaking out because of the promise that I told you that I promised myself that I would make to our consumers. And we got, on average, for a kind bar product line, I'm doing it from memory so I may get a little off, but it's something like less than one complaint per million. It's, I think, 0 0.01 complaint per million. We almost don't get complaints. All of a sudden, we got 200 complaints per million on the clusters, and for us, that was a very, very alarm, alarming thing. Maybe in another company, it would be acceptable. For us, we were really obsessing about quality. We didn't want to disappoint consumers, because every one person that complains, at least that person, you can talk to them, and you can fix the issue with them, and you can even build a relationship with that person. But for every person that complains, there's another 1,000 or 10,000 that just stop buying your product. Those are the people that I worry about. So, so we very quickly, we had a couple people camp out. Camp out. I remember uh, several of our team members uh, went there for weeks on end to try to fix the issue, and I was really appreciative of their major sacrifice on behalf of the company to fix it. And within you know, two, three months, we, we, we improved our practices for sourcing these grains. Uh, within a few months, the number of complaints was back down to like 0 0.01 per million or whatever is in the book. But it, it was a humbling lesson in when you're entering a new adjacency, uh, be careful about sourcing ingredients with, 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 with care.
And actually, just to follow up on that, when you're structuring your organization to be able to take these kinds of smart, uh, methodical bets, do you uh, do you have sort of a classic brand management, you know, category managers, brand managers, and sort of innovation managers, or do you do you try to structure the team differently to uh, to suit the kind strategy? Um, first of all, we just brought in an amazing head of marketing. Her name is Lisa Mann. She had an incredible career. She could probably answer your question 10 times better than I can. And what I love about Kind is that we attract people and bring people that are better than I am at the areas of their expertise. And so she is going to be working with our team in reviewing all of the way we currently do things to see how we do them differently. But the way we've done it in the past, I really tried to get our team to think more from the gut than from the data. I have awesome team members that bring so many data insights. And by the way, I really appreciate them because they're very different from me. And I don't think enough from the data. And data is very important. But when you're designing something new, the data is obviously very important when you're selling. <laughs> it's, it's very useful data. And it's to some degree useful also when you're planning. But when you're innovating, Data only tells you the history of where you're coming from. It doesn't tell you where you need to go. And it also doesn't tell, me, tell you who you are, your brand promise. So you need to be very careful when you're looking at data, not to try to chase a fad that's ephemeral or that belongs to somebody else. So I really try to work with my team for them to think completely out of the box. So we have a very a traditional structure on the new product development side because we're trying to think a tradition. And a lot of the innovation that's coming is coming from team members that are just completely thinking outside the box. And we try not to put them in, in too structured an environment because I don't want them to think that just because they come from here, the next thing is, is in that same space. Right. Other questions from the audience? Should we wrap up? We have two more minutes if, if anybody <laughs> wants to win. Uh, a free car? Was that what were there? <laughs> was that coming from Kind or is that? No, I thought Google. Google oh. well, it's a Google car, right? <laughs> um, Random House is here and they're my partners from Ballantin Books, so thank you for, for being great partners. And uh, The books are in sale in, in the back. The books as well. are in sale and uh, you saw all of our Kind team uh, giving you, treating you to some products. So thank you to Juliana and, and Rebecca for putting this together and to all of our team members um, in the field team that are every day nourishing our, the community. Thank you so much for having us, guys. Thanks for coming, Daniel.